So welcome Zero Project community. It is a real pleasure to have so many of you with us at the Zero Conference 2021. With over 3,400 participants online, this year's virtual conference has become a truly global gathering space for those committed to disability inclusion. With so many attendees from all around the world, it is easy to forget to mention the backbone of global gatherings like these, namely trusted partner organizations such as the ILO. Thank you so much for putting together this valuable partner channel session. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you with us today. Without further ado, I wish you well and look forward to seeing you online and on the conference platform. All the best. Yes, thank you very, thank you very much for, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm Stefan Trümmel, um, Senior Disability Specialist in the International Labour Organization, and I'm also coordinating the ILO Global Business and, and Disability Network. Uh, and it's a great pleasure today to be moderating this, um, this, this session, uh, addressing what I would define as, as, as a frontier issue, a new issue within our, uh, within our community. And um, I would like in particular to thank uh, Susan Scott Parker, who was uh, one of the speakers for uh, in fact, having taken the lead on, uh, on, awareness on this important issue within the business and disability community. Um, we all have seen, we have been listening these days and we will continue to listen today and tomorrow about uh, examples of, um, of technology, including artificial intelligence that are really having a very positive impact on, on the lives of persons with disabilities and including also on their uh, um, employment opportunities. But, but today we will be looking at, at, at uh, artificial intelligence from a slightly different angle. Um, we have, we have, um, we just launched yesterday a, a report on um, on the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the digital economy. Um, I encourage you all to um, to read it. Uh, it. It looks at at the impact, in particular, also of the COVID nineteen has had on, on on the current situation. It it makes some recommendations in terms of how to ensure that persons with disabilities uh, will benefit uh, from the opportunities of the digital economy. Uh, it's not straightforward, there are challenge opportunities. It's, it lies on us to make sure that um, we uh, push for the opportunities and, and, address, and address the challenges. Now, this is a very important topic for ILO GBDN members. Um, we, we know that re initial recruitment, the, let's say the, the, the entry door for persons with disabilities into the private sector, for instance, continues to be a door that, op that often is not wide enough, it's not open enough. We, we know that sometimes it is about um, human-based uh, recruitment processes that, uh, that leads to failure. Interviewers, human resource staff are often not well prepared to highlight or identify the talents that persons with disabilities can bring to their companies. And with a lot of many experiences what, where, uh, which, which we know about. We are seeing, and we are addressing it, in fact, through a new uh, initiative in collaboration with the International Telecommunications Union, another UN entity. We know that there are barriers to online recruitment, e-recruitment, uh, very often the steps in that process which inadvertently exclude some people with disabilities, at least. All that we already know, and then we're starting to work on, on that, um, but today we're going to look at 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 a new at a new angle. As you know, many large companies, in view of the very high number of um, job applicants applications that they receive, are starting to use uh, recruitment software that will help them to filter from these thousands of uh, applications they might receive. They will filter uh, out some of those, some of those, or many of those. So that human intervention only comes in at the later stage, dealing with those applications that have passed these first tests. Now, evidence shows, and Susan will, will, will highlight that, that uh, this software, which is based on artificial intelligence, if it's not well done, and we've not yet seen any of, I think, any of the software that is that's dealing with that adequately, can lead to the exclusion 
of people that fall out a bit of the norm. It can be because of disability, it can also be, be because of other issues. No? And I think that that is the big issue that we are addressing here today. Put yourself in the shoes of a large company that is committed to disability inclusion, that is a member of the ILO Global Business and Disability Network, that committed to disability inclusion, but perhaps the human resource department would have recently acquired such a software and inadvertently and without the knowledge of our colleagues, uh, this new software is leading to the exclusion, to not giving candidates, possibly some candidates with disabilities, not giving them the chances to get a job in that company, in that organization. As you know, in, in, in these frontier issues, legislation is always behind. First, these issues come in, these new, these new changes. We have legislation protecting from discrimination on the basis of disability, we have the UN Convention. But when we were drafting the UN Convention, this was not yet an issue. So legislation will always be a step behind. We're always trying to catch up with these new, uh, new situations. And that's one of the discussions we should have today. We also are seeing that there are a lot of discussions in the AI, artificial intelligence community about the ethical implications of AI. We've, we've heard some of those discussions, the use of, of robots, of drones in a military context. I mean, we've seen all that. But it's also fair to say that the disability angle to that um, ethical discussion or the ethical dimension of artificial intelligence has not yet uh, taken off. So these are hopefully topics that will interest all of you. We had initially uh, planned to have three keynote speakers, all excellent, but uh, one of them, Sally Nugent from the Oxford University, uh, who is directly working on, um, on artificial intelligence and ethical implications. It seems she has a very significant migraine today. And of course, migraine and, and a Zoom webinar is not necessarily the best, the best combination. So it seems, I'm still looking at the list of panelists, it seems that she will not be joining us, which means that we will have more time uh, to hear both from, uh, from Susan, uh, as well as from Yves Veillet, uh, and also, of course, more time for questions and answers, which um, you can, especially those of you who are directly connected on the Zoom platform, you can definitely send those to us through the Q&A box that you should have at the bottom of your screen. So I will ask now for, for a second, both uh, Susan and Eve to, to put on your camera so people can see uh, whom we have on the call uh, alongside myself and, and our two uh, international sign interpreters. So um, as mentioned, we have with us uh, Eve Villiers, uh, Global Disability and Inclusion Leader within, um, within IBM. Eve, always good to see you. Eve was also chair of the ILO Global Business Disability Network back in 2019 and has always been a very active leader in the business and disability community. And of course, you, you all know Susan Scott Parker. Susan, I can't see your camera on. So um, and I'm asking for some support from our technical team to allow for Susan to be, to be seen, especially as Susan will be our first speaker today. Okay. So we were just um, vetoing your, your, your image. <laughs> Um, Susan um, is well known, uh, she's, uh, she's the CEO and founder of Business Disability International. Uh, I don't think there is any other person in the world that has so much experience um, on uh, business and disability as, as Susan. I know Susan, we know each other for many, many years and already before we met many years, you already were, had been working on this issue uh, for a long time. But not only have you this huge, vast and long experience, but you always are so good in bringing to our community these new issues, these new challenges that many of us had not even thought about when I first heard about it. You brought it to our conference uh, in November 2019. It's the first time uh, you had a short presentation. It. I know you have been working with uh, companies and with universities on this issue. So thank you, Susan, in particular, for bringing this, the attention to our community to this issue and uh, the floor to, over to you. Thank you very much, Stefan. You know, as I'm listening to your introduction, Stefan, you're talking about large companies. However, I'm convinced that one of the reasons this is particularly important to our international community is that the use of this artificial intelligence recruitment HR technology is going to be increasingly fashionable with the smaller organizations. And my fear, of course, is that if we don't address this now and with urgency, we could see 
labor markets, well, say Nairobi, where every employer will be using this technology because it seems to be so effective and it will be very difficult for any non-standard applicant, not just, but particularly people with disabilities to, to get a job um, unless they're going through the process. So I wanted to just take us a, a, a little bit today through why I, I became obsessed, if you like, with this issue. And it really started with an article I read in the UK press, which quoted a recruitment technology company saying that they were proud that their standardized assessment process removed human bias because every candidate would be treated exactly the same. Well, obviously I was startled. I mean, surely everyone knows that the essence of treating disabled candidates fairly is to flex the process, to make reasonable adjustments or accommodations at every stage, to create a level playing field. I mean, it's just called equal opportunities. Imagine asking Stephen Hawking to climb stairs to the interview just because the standard process says everyone must use the stairs. So of course, I started to ask questions. And it immediately became clear that for many recruiters, their primary task, given as Stefan says, the numbers of people now applying online, their primary task seems to be to discard as many as possible as quickly as possible. And of course, as cost effectively as possible. It also became immediately clear that neither developers nor their HR customers, despite, despite all the talk about bias that is emerging in the AI and ethics debate, none of these individuals were talking about disability bias. They weren't addressing the impact of these tools on the people with disabilities that make up 15 to 20% of the population of any country. And then as we looked at this exploding HR tech marketplace, so many different types of products from you know, testing CVs to doing all kinds of assessments and so on, we realized we were looking at AI powered tools which have the potential to damage the life chances of hundreds of millions of persons with disabilities around the world. Even though, now I have some statistics that I would use with an audience of technology experts in artificial intelligence, I'm sure this audience knows, you know, at least one in three humans will have a disability or be close to someone who is. Um, one in five women will have a disability. At least one in three people aged 50 to 64 will have a disability, regardless of ethnicity. And at least 10 to 12% of any workforce will have a disability in large organizations and or a chronic health condition. So you can rattle off these stats. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about a sector that really focuses on data and intel and statistics and so on. So it was very puzzling not to see persons with disabilities ever referenced in this growing debate regarding responsible AI. In fact, it seems that disabled people are so missing from the debate that no one's even noticed that they're not there. To illustrate, I was told by one large AI firm that a tool designed to detect AI bias can't detect disability bias because, and I quote, well, they aren't in the database. And of course, given disabled people are always at least twice as unlikely to be in work, and given most HR technology focuses on data regarding people in work, well, I guess it's safe to say that if you aren't in the database, you never will be. If we look at the actual assessment tools, Neither their content, their usability, nor their accessibility has usually been validated or tested on job seekers or on employees with disabilities. The video interviews, for example, which assess the extent to which your nonverbal communications, your word choice, your voice pattern, even your voice tone, your eye movement, they assess the extent to which all of this matches those of the ideal employee but they ignore the impact of disability on a candidate's nonverbal communications, word choice, voice tone, eye movement, etc. There's a virtual reality test, for example, where you are dropped into an ancient Egyptian tomb to test your problem solving skills. My friend who's a wheelchair user says he dreams in his wheelchair. Will that virtual reality test let him use his wheelchair as he navigates his way out of the tomb? Actually, I was told today it won't. And so imagine what it would be like for him to be dropped into an ancient Egyptian tomb as a walker. And then we see the increasingly popular gamified assessments. 
how many have checked that the gaming controls can be used by people with limited dexterity or color blindness? Do you remember the young man whose disability, Tourette's syndrome, caused his hands to twitch? He posted his story on LinkedIn saying, as he tried to get through these gamified assessments, it was impossible to find any human beings he could talk to to explain that he could actually do the do job, it's just that he could not play the game. And there's a crucial but unrecognized difference between biased data and the unfair treatment triggered by how the automated process actually works in practice. You know, little things like no captions on a video interview or timing candidates out after three minutes. I mean, if you take the Swedish robot interview, the website for their company claims they have eliminated human bias regarding race and gender. Well, my data scientists tell me that if humans invented it, it can't have eliminated human bias. Anyway, there's a scientific challenge there. And of course, there's no reference to disability bias, but, but then there never is. So, so we keep going. And then as you look at this, you think, how does this robot deal with the candidate who could sail through if he could lip read the robot or he could use a sign language interpreter and the robot would know who to look at? How does this robot adapt for the excellent candidate who stammers and just needs more than the standard 20 minutes? Or someone who could do the job, but because of their intellectual disability, they need the robot to turn those standard questions into shorter sentences. How does someone with what should we call it a non-standard face, a facial disfigurement or acid burns, Down syndrome, how do they get through a video interview when their face doesn't register as a face? Or someone who doesn't make eye contact because they can't, or who doesn't smile because they can't. Standardized, let's call them what they are, rigid recruitment processes are by definition inherently discriminatory. So the big question is who is responsible for ensuring equal opportunities at every step of the way? And isn't it curious that as I even say equal opportunities, it feels so old fashioned. Somehow the language of diversity is diverting us from the fact that first we have to ensure fair treatment. Well, developers say it's the employer's responsibility in law. And then the employer says, but our supplier tells us that this inflexible process is unbiased precisely because it is standardized. Neither make it possible at any stage for the applicant as they're trying to, to apply for the job and go through the application process to request dignified and equitable access to equal opportunities at any step. They don't make it possible to ask for the adjustments with equal fair treatment, given it's only fair treatment is only made possible by adjusting the process so it's not standard. And then we have the fourth dimension to the problem. So we've got the disability bias in the data, standardized process that trigger unfair treatment. We've got HR buyers, diversity managers, and AI developers who just don't understand disability discrimination. And in addition, we have developers and their HR clients who ignore the impact of the future employer's behavior on the tool's ability to accurately assess whether this candidate who has a disability could do the job. How could an AI tool accurately assess a blind cybersecurity expert? If the tool fails to ask, will the employer let this candidate use the tools she needs when she starts the job, voice activated software or whatever it might be? She cannot be accurately assessed for a cybersecurity job unless the tool recognizes that blindness on its own need not preclude high performance. The tool does not assume successful candidates will make eye contact in the standard way. The assessment takes into account that the employer will or will not make the reasonable adjustment that's needed so that she can succeed. And finally, the process does not stigmatize the candidate who is discovered by the artificial intelligence tool to be non-standard and who then needs to sort of ring a bell to call in a human assessor to the process. So the good news is we are making progress. The first such white paper, Recruitment AI has a disability problem by Salin, such a pity she couldn't be with us today. Her white paper focused primarily on the risks to the employers and to the job seekers. It was published recently by Oxford Brookes University's Institute for Ethical AI. Please take a look at it 
Selin welcomes ongoing comment. She sees this as very much work in process. IBM recently published a second paper called Designing Artificial Intelligence Applications to Treat People with Disabilities Fairness. They present six steps to fairness, which I think you'll find very useful. And again, I know IBM welcomes comment and very much hoping that Eve will be with us today to take us through a little more detail. Simmons & Simmons, the global law firm, are continuing to work with us as we look at what HR needs if they are to minimize the risks here. So in effect, this is buyer beware territory, because if the HR community starts to better understand the risks that appear when they deploy this technology without really challenging the extent to which it is delivering equal opportunities for everyone, um, well, they can really be a force for change here. And I must note that HireVue, uh, a market leader in terms of AI powered recruitment assessments, have announced that they will no longer analyze a candidate's facial expressions in video interviews following an independent risk audit, which I think is really quite significant. And we see human rights and equality regulators beginning to consider adopting some of the principles that shape not just the, the um, human rights and equal opportunities related regulatory environment, but consumer protection. I would certainly argue that developers should be required by law to prove that their artificial intelligence recruitment tools are safe for disabled and other disadvantaged job seekers before they can put them on the market. In conclusion, we know that systems that work for extreme users work better for everyone. A fair and accurate recruitment assessment that enables someone who is is deaf or blind or dyslexic, autistic, facially disfigured, has a mobility impairment, has a speech impairment, and so on and so on. Systems that enable individuals as extreme users to actually be assessed uh, fairly and uh, accurately are more likely to work better for everyone. I mean, my, my throwaway remark at this point is usually even a a not yet disabled Canadian woman could get through. So I think in terms of our conversation today, I'm very interested in the extent to which the advocates in the disability community can join us to raise the profile of this issue. We're really not seeing, um, if you like, much energy around this. As Stefan said, it is an emerging issue, but now is the time when the developers are just beginning to start to listen to the entire debate around ethics and responsibility to say it's not enough just to talk about gender and about race. You're talking about women with disabilities. You're talking about ethnic minority individuals with disabilities. You're talking about people with disabilities, because if you're not, ethics for some is not ethical. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, there are a number, um, so many issues that, that you have been addressed. Um, uh, participants uh, will be happy to hear that we are recording the, the webinar and, and you will be able to listen more carefully and calmly to so much information that Susan has already um, brought up. And uh, definitely there are a number of issues. Um, I will come back to you, Susan, um, after, after each presentation. Eve, uh, Susan has already put you on the spot because she has referred to to the work that, that IBM has, has been doing. So um, without further ado, uh, over to you. Thank you, Stefan. You know how much I love to be under the spot, under the spotlight. So it's not really a difficult moment for me. Uh, now, seriously, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be, to be with you here. So I'm not going to repeat what Susan said, um, but when she, she started to speak with me about this, um, you know, basically, IBM's position around ethical AI is clear. We've put in place um, what we call an AI ethics review board to make sure that all our applications, all our app solutions that we sell to our clients, that we implement internally, etc., cetera, uh, is really uh, matches the highest uh, ethical standards possible. Uh, and you know, basically, IBM is it, it has a long tradition of, of um, welcoming, including people with disabilities or diverse abilities. 
uh, within the IBM corporation and uh, AI, you know, basically IBM is in a hybrid cloud and AI company. And so for us, it's extremely important to, to address this, uh, this issue and to tackle the possible risks of having people with disabilities excluded from, uh, from the job market simply because the algorithms are not defined uh, appropriately, are not inclusive enough. IBM's position is pretty clear on this in this space. You know, we believe that the purpose of, um, of AI is to augment, uh, not replace, augment human intelligence and human decision making. Uh, basically, IBM says that AI solutions must account for everyone. As you know, as artificial intelligence becomes, uh, I would say, um, pervasive, high profile cases of racial and gen or even gender bias uh, have emerged, as Susan said, uh, but discrimination against people with disabilities, and let's face it, is a long standing problem uh, in society in general. It could be reduced by technology, as a matter of fact, but it could also be exacerbated by it. And so we have a responsibility, uh, IBM has a responsibility as an IT technology uh, company to, uh, you know, we are basically technology creators uh, to ensure that our technologies uh, reflect our values and shape uh, lives and, and I would say uh, society uh, for, for the better. Uh, challenges in, in, in fairness for um, people with disabilities, uh, I would say that stem from human failure uh, to fully consider diversity when designing, testing and, um, and deploying systems. Uh, if standardized processes like the recruitment pre-screening system are not built around inclusive algorithms, uh, there is a major risk of systematically excluding people who um, do not belong to, to the standard models of, uh, of employees in general. So as Susan said, uh, to address this, uh, this risk, uh, we offer ways to develop AI-based uh, applications that treat people with disabilities fairly by uh, embedding ethics into AI development from the very beginning. And this is important. Uh, if you do that from the very beginning of the creation of an algorithm, you will avoid 90% of danger of creating biases. This is what we call, as Susan said, the six steps to fairness. So I'm not going to go into the details of all these fairness um, steps, but you, know, you, you will find, uh, I, I assume you will receive a link to the uh, IBM paper uh, as part of this uh, recording of this session. But in a nutshell, these six um, steps are for web developers, where algorithm uh, writers are ident identifying risks, involve stakeholders, define what it means for this application to be fair, plan for outliers, test for model bias and mitigate, and last but not least, build accessible solutions. So this is for uh, the IT part of our recommendation, but there is also a crucial, uh, essential uh, stakeholder that must be mentioned in addition to IT specialists, buyers, etc. It's policy makers. They also have a role to play about balancing innovation, inclusion and fairness in the presence of rapidly advancing AI-based uh, technologies. We call for a risk-based use case uh, focus approach to AI regulation. Um, applying the same rules to all uh, AI applications would not make sense given its many users uh, and the outcomes that, um, that derive from them, uh, from, it, from their use. So we believe that governments and industry uh, must work together to, um, to strike 
an appropriate balance between effective rules that protect the public interest uh, and the need to, um, to promote ongoing innovation and experimentation. With uh, such a, a precision regulation approach, we, we, we can answer expectations uh, of fairness, accountability, and transparency according to the role of the organization uh, and the risk associated with uh, each use of AI. Um, getting the balance uh, right between fairness, precision regulation, innovation, diversity and inclusion uh, will be an ongoing challenge. This is a reality that we have to live with for policymakers worldwide, but it doesn't prevent them uh, from starting to really think about it and to really uh, start thinking about how to best tackle uh, this risk going forward. Because as Susan said, this is not something that will happen in 10 years from now. This is happening today. And this is now the time to start thinking of working together, policymakers, IT developers, associations, GBDN, all NGOs, everybody, all stakeholders must work together to fix this. So, as I said, IBM believes that the purpose of AI is to augment, um, not replace uh, human intelligence and human decision making. And so, co to conclude, I would say that AI systems must be uh, transparent, robust, and explainable. Although the development and deployment of AI are still in their early stages, uh, it's a critical tool whose uh, utility will uh, continue to, to flourish over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yves. Uh, as I mentioned at, at the beginning, uh, we, we were planning to have a third speaker uh, who comes from the AI um, community and looking at, 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 at the ethical dimension of AI. So I think that she would have made a huge contribution to it. But I know that both uh, Eve and um, Susan, you have been in contact uh, with her and and are aware a bit of some of the of this working process in progress that um, that Susan you mentioned. Perhaps what I would suggest now, um, I will come up with a few questions to both of you. Um, on some questions, I might perhaps um, target one of you specifically, but please feel free to come in. Um, both of you, and, and, and the good thing about having lost the speaker, if we have more time than one usually has for these discussions, uh, but, I, and I, but I think we're, we're gonna make a good use of it. Now, um, you both mentioned um, the, the, the important role of disability organization, and Susan, you rightly point out that so far there has been little attention by the disability community to this issue, which I would say it's not such a surprise. I mean, there's so many challenges still that the disability community has to face uh, that uh, such a sort of um, niche issue, um, first, it, it just requires that, that uh, an awareness raising. I think that is a very important issue already today with our webinars. We are raising awareness, hopefully, to a larger group community about the problem. Uh, so far, it has been a problem that only very few people, and thanks to you mostly, uh, have been uh, made, made aware of. So I think there's an important awareness raising dimension to it. I think uh, that. The issue is not so easy to solve. No, I mean, uh, the, probably the easiest way to say to solve it would be say, no, you don't, you just don't use uh, any artificial intelligence-based <laughs> recruitment software, and you go back to to um, to human-based soft uh, recruitment, which of course we also know it also has its bias. But okay, but that might probably be not the solution. Um, a lot of interest in it. We, we can understand from the point of view of a large company that is faced with so many applications that they want to find some way of uh, filtering that. No? So it's unlikely that companies will not use uh, the software. We have seen some companies deciding in the meantime to sort of at least put it on hold, not no longer to use it again because they are aware of the bias. Uh, so that's already good. But sooner or later, first, that not every company will do that. Um, but um, so we need to find ways to, to eliminate the, the risk or at least to minimize it as much as possible. No? Now, um, we, we usually say in, 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 in our space that um, we speak about universal design and we say that, and we said it also in this publication we launched yesterday, the more that people with disabilities are part of the research teams, the more we can ensure that disability dimension is taken 
into account from the beginning versus running after the train and always coming too late because by the, by the, time, by the time you've made that train accessible or that new software already, not, the new version is coming out, which again, is not accessible. No? So I was just wondering, have you seen any example, uh, and question goes to both of you, particularly also to, to Eve, have you seen, uh, I know you also have, you're using the employee resource group, business resource groups with, within the IBM. Do you see that there is a, there's an interlink there between, um, or can you see already that there are persons with disabilities directly involved in some of these um, R&D processes? And I think that that is part, could be part of the solution already right, to, to take that dimension into account by directly having people with disabilities part of these uh, R&D uh, teams. Thank you, uh, Stefan, for this, this question. Actually, you're absolutely right. Uh, people with diverse abilities will play an essential key role in making sure that accessibility uh, becomes no longer an option, basically. Uh, the, what we did in IBM, as you said, we have uh, business, business resource groups. This is how we refer to employee resource group internally. We have 30, more than 30 resource groups uh, worldwide. So what we did, what we did is that we built a team of testers living with different types of, of, of disability, uh, blind, mobility, cognitive, hearing, whatever. And we asked them to play an active role in testing the applications that our team develop, that we also acquire and deploy internally, because it's also important to make sure that our procurement team, our buyers, take accessible into account as a key criteria, as a mandatory criteria, when they discuss with vendors about the, the acquisition of an application. Because in the past, we saw that accessibility was no, not really discussed as a key, key criteria for negotiation. As a result, when the applications were deployed internally, they were either partially accessible, not compatible with assistive technologies, or not accessible at all. Which means that, as you can imagine, it had a direct impact on the performance and productivity of our employees. And to avoid that, we did two things. As I said, we created what we call the team able. So it's composed of employees, most of them being technical, living with different types of disabilities that will test the application that are being de deployed in IBM so that they can provide technical recommendations to developers, to uh, technicians, etc., to make sure that the tool prior to his, his global deployment will match with, will meet the accessibility requirements, at least a minimal uh, level of accessibility requirements. And in addition, we've put in place training programs to uh, educate our procurement teams to make sure that they take accessibility seriously as part of the negotiation, the discussion with the vendor. So that working both at bottom of approach from, from a bottom of approach leveraging our employees as well from a top-down approach, leveraging the organizational structure of the IBM corporation, it's really effective. And this is also what we do with the AI uh, topics that we are discussing today we, we, we really leverage all resources we have, that we have internally, the AI ethics board, the AI um, alliance that you may be aware that uh, our CEO, Arvind Krishna, as part of the uh, for, forum, Web World Economic Forum in Davos is now leading the Global AI Alliance. So we try to find all avenues possible to make sure that uh, this topic becomes part of the AI ethics board the AI um, vision that IBM has. It's extremely important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, we have a question to you, which, which links to what both of you said. There's also definitely a need for, um, for policymakers and, and legislation to, um, to, to deal with this issue. And, and basically the question is, 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 is around, is uh, anti-discrimination legislation in particular, like you have in the, in the UK, the American with Disabilities Act in the US, as you know, the UN convention has a strong, very strong non-discrimination focus. Do you think that, I mean, you've mentioned also the consumer protection part, but focusing for a moment initially on the anti-discrimination legislation, how much 
do you think is is it ready to uh, to deal with these new forms of, of of discrimination and have you seen any sort of discussion about or sort of um, trying to see how to to tweak that legislation to to cover these situations I think because we're stuck in this paradigm where an individual has to take an employer to court to prove under the ADA or our legislation that they were treated unfairly by an algorithm, right? And so I'm not seeing much creative thinking about how that shifts. What we have in our legislation under the, cu the customer right of access is an anticipatory, anticipatory duty where you have to anticipate that you're going to have wheelchair using customers. And so you have to be barrier free for people with mobility impairments in advance. You don't have to wait for someone to turn up and then take you to court because it's not there. Now I'm not optimistic that we're going to see that kind of legislation usefully uh, deployed here in the near future. I do think there are a lot of lawyers in America that are looking forward to this because the time it's going to take for individuals to prove their case is going to be considerable and their fees will go up accordingly. I, we do see some sign though that governments are starting to look at this seriously. The government of Canada has announced that they will only purchase artificial technology on the condition that they can see what's in the box. And because of the commercial confidentiality argument around the algorithms and you know the commercial secrecy there, it's when the buyers insist that they have to be able to look in that box if a citizen of Canada suffers harm as a result of the government using this technology. I think that's where we're going to see the, the most action in the short term. Sounds good, sounds good. I have a, a, a more difficult question to, to, to address, which um, has come from, from Nancy Doyle. Nancy, Nancy as, as you, Susan, as you know her well, uh, is a top expert on, on new diversity. Now, the, the question has disappeared from my screen, so I, otherwise I would I have can see it, I can see it. Can see it. Well, uh, try to deal with it. The whole, the question from Nancy is basically whether artificial intelligence is sort of not flawed almost from, from inception in terms of this focus on the, on the norm, um, on, on the majority norm versus, of course, uh, which would always, let's say, almost by definition, exclude uh, new mi minorities. I'm, I'm sort of rephrasing <laughs> Nancy's question, which of course was, 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 was worded much better, but a very interesting general reflection, uh, but uh, Susan, give it a try. Well, as someone who's not an expert on artificial intelligence, just on the impact, I think I know where Nancy's going on this. And yes, there is an argument that says if it's big data that drives artificial intelligence, then outliers, the non-standards, will always be uh, badly served. Um, Jutta Trevenaras at the Institute for Inclusive Design in, in Canada is doing some very good work on this as a data scientist, looking at how you shift the artificial intelligence scientists, if you like, from seeking data which is helping them to predict stuff in the future and to move into comprehension, comprehending what it is that you're actually looking at and what you want to achieve rather than looking for the numbers which you can spin to predict trends or, or whatever in the future. I think we are seeing two things happening. One is the science which says that I can predict Stefan's performance on the job by the way his face communicates emotional responses when I tease him or insult him. There is no scientific validity to much that's going on there in terms of just the assessments. Never mind the fact that those assessments are then being delivered or uh, managed, if you like, for the company with an artificial intelligence tool. So um, Nadja Guillaume at Goldsmiths here is doing some very interesting work looking at the actual science that underpins psychometric tests online. Who's, who can prove that these psychometric tests actually, actually have scientific rigor behind them? And then you ask someone in, in one of the, the newer minority groups that Nancy is particularly working with to go through a psychometric test online, and you might as well ask you know, a wheelchair user to climb stairs. It's just nonsense. But even if he could get up those stairs, I'm not sure that psychometric test is going to tell the employer anything really useful. Um, if if you've, you've mentioned the, um, the issue of, of procurement, I mean, um, as you know, well, as you both know, the, the whole issue of procurement is, is uh, can be, if, if well done, can really be a game changer in terms of promoting accessible products. What be, um, and the question goes to both of you, but if perhaps you, you give a first go, what would be your advice to, um, to a company that is currently now considering buying, uh, buying such a software? 
would you uh, tell them to sort of wait? Would you what? How could they include in the in the procurement requirements something that that would ensure that they're able to buy a good software? Assuming to some extent, perhaps I'm wrong, that probably all the existing software right now in the market, none of it is is, is adequately addressing this issue. Absolutely, it's uh, it, it's not that difficult. It's just a matter of making sure that you have the appropriate executive engagement within the organization to make it a priority and no longer a nice to have. Basically, all procurement organizations do have some sort of a checklist that you know with a list of requirements that must be met as part of their negotiation, first to acquire and deploy an applications in general. And if you simply make an amendment to these criteria to include accessibility as having the equal value as cost or quality in general, you know, basically there is no need to reinvent the wheel. The accessibility standards are er everywhere. You know, they are, they are available on, on Google. If you type accessibility standard, you may get tons of different uh, websites, but still, uh, everything is documented so there is no need to hide behind saying mm, i'm not clear about what accessibility means everything is clearly defined so all the procurement team has to do is to simply include accessibility requirements with a reference to uh, a list of criteria that must be met as part of this negotiation with the vendors and most of the time you know most of the time, honestly, our vendors are listening to us because, you know, it's a big market, right? So you, you, you tend to listen to your clients when your clients uh, have a, a real value for you and you want to make sure that you will satisfy them. So if our procurement team clearly says, okay, your products are good, but did you think about the compatibility with screen readers? Did you think about making sure that, you know, the fonts, et cetera, are accessible? They will think about it and they will come back to you with uh, with the appropriate remediations to their product. And most of the time, I must say that we, we launched this, uh, we implemented this amendment uh, since July last year. And ever since we have not received, we have not received one single complaint for something that was deployed after that date that was not accessible, simply because now it's become mandatory. Eve, I have no, to no, I, I think, uh, I think I that, that, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. But um, Susie, you were shaking your head. I mean, the problem I, I see is how, yes, from, from, let's say from an accessibility point of view, we are working on digital accessibility. I think, yeah, it should be done much more, as you say. But how do you apply that to the, the, this software based on AI, which is almost every software that is out there is 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 have is sort of has this uh... well it's unfair uh -huh. i think there's a difference here between inaccessible and and an unfair recruitment process so what you saw me shaking my head at was higher view argued their website was accessible it's just that they then took decisions about what you could do on the basis of data that was not reflective of your your reality right they they it's the science they were quoting at the heart of it that was part of the issue so accessibility is hugely important but the kind of questions that we would be asking you know the companies that produce this uh, these artificial intelligence tools are were tell us about how many and which persons with disabilities were actively involved in helping you to understand their reality when you were mapping the reality how did you factor in when you set the objectives for this assessment how it was going to respond for people who used a variety of communication methodologies, right? It's, so if you've got a three minute limit on the questions you're asking in the interview, when the robot interviews you, what happens if the person stammers and needs an extra 10 seconds? So it's asking the right questions in terms of their involvement and understanding that disability, ha you know, how they're going to um, factor in the reality of the lived experience of disabled applicants trying to get through this process with accessibility being part of the puzzle. And so I do think that um, Salen has started to list some of those questions in her white paper. We've sent the, the link out to our audience, um, but it is new territory because of course, it's not just the artificial intelligence um, tool manufacturers 
is the fact that the HR and the diversity people who use these tools don't understand disability discrimination. They don't understand they have to say at the beginning, have you, you know, what kind of adjustments would make it easier for you to go through this process? They don't explain the process to the candidates so they can anticipate, oh, I'm going to be interviewed on a video. Oh, I need captions. I better tell them. So it's Susan, uh, Susan, if, uh, if, if Celine would have been with us today, uh, we, we would probably I would have asked her, what more can we can we do to get disability more prominently on the on the discussion on the ethical dimension of artificial intelligence? We have just five minutes left. So any sort of brilliant final idea around that. And then I will just have a fi final minute just with uh, addressing a couple of other issues that have come up in them. There's a question I see saying the CRPD committee are preparing a paper on employment. For me, the disability sector shouldn't see this artificial intelligence as a niche issue. It's about how people get jobs. And we need to be working much more closely with the business community so we understand what they do when they set out to offer people jobs, because otherwise we can't coach individuals on how to get through it. I do think um, the, your question being, how do we raise the profile of this? Everyone who's on this call, and we had 60 people going mad on LinkedIn, um, everybody saying to the CRPD committee, why haven't you got this yet? How can we do that? Here's a white paper, at least starting to ask the questions. We're not at the point where we've got the answers, but putting pressure on every business disability network that we know to say, where's the guidance that you're offering your members in case they're tempted to start to move into this. And somebody needs to offer guidance to the individual. How do you negotiate when you need to get through these processes and you have to ask for a different approach without the stigma bell going on that says, oh, we've got a disabled one here, what do we do? So any organization and any funder trying to get people into work needs to understand this because this is how you get jobs now. Yeah, but I think the, putting the onus on the individuals is tough, no? Because I mean, if, if no, you're- but I'm saying they need guidance as well. I'm not for saying- For sure, for sure. But I think it's it's mostly what the, the I think it was the issue of class action, which in the US is, is, is some, I mean, if, if there, there's in this, we can really prove that there's this embedded bias. Um, disability organizations will, and, and other partners, national human rights institutions need to take a, a role in, in that. Um, Eve, a final reflection from, from your side. Well, as, as um, Susan said, you know, it's, although the AI system, um, as I said, must be transparent, robust, and explainable, uh, the development and deployment of AI are still in their early stages. And so now is the time, as Susan said, to spread the message to make it this issue much more visible. Because if we wait six more months, if we wait one more year, this will, this will be much more difficult to tackle because everything will become operational at that time. And, and, and you know, if now is the time, really. We don't, we don't have much time. The window is shrinking day after day and we need to act now. Yeah, and it's part Excellent. of the e-recruitment problem overall. It's not it just is. this, it's e-recruitment. So thank heavens, Stephanie, you're starting to address that. Exactly. We have, we have the participants, we assume we have hopefully many other hundreds of participants who have watched our uh, video through the live stream. Uh, the, the, the event has been, the webinar has been recorded. We're going we to create a section on the GBDN website focusing on, on this issue where we were going to put uh, this video uh, as well as the different white papers and documents that we, that we have managed. And the ILO um, is involved in the drafting process of the, the general comment on the CRPD committee. We are providing a technical support to the committee on this issue. And definitely, uh, I fully agree with the participant who has raised that issue. We will be bringing this issue to the attention of the CRPD committee. They had asked us to be ready to address some of the new challenges that are coming. So I think uh, I cannot think of a better example of a challenge that 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 we that we need to address, and I fully agree. Uh, if uh, it's it's the time is now, no? so so thanks to both of you for having um, volunteered to address this uh, frontier issue uh, in such a clear um, and and timely manner. Um, million thanks, and and thanks to all the to all the participants who have listened in. I I, I think really this has been uh, an amazing uh, an amazing session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good Thank end you. of the day.